Good morning. Like you look different. I'm wearing glasses. That's what it is. Okay, so so how we doing? We're good. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I love this talk. I love doing this. I love doing the send off because I get to give you the bad news of it's coming to an end. Um, even though he said it's just it's not over yet, but. There's a reality that happens when you come to a Steubenville conference, right, or any conference or any retreat or any, any place where you have, like, that moment of encounter with the Lord. There's something incredible that happens, and, and there's, a, there's a desire to stay in that place, right? Wouldn't it be great? Like, I, I'm sure there's, there's a certain uh, degree of, of, of sadness, maybe, or just kind of like, ah. Uh, I have to go back home. I have to go back into the world. And, and yeah, and I mean, I think the apostles also had that same feeling, you know, like when they went up on the mountain with Jesus, whenever Jesus was transfigured in front of them, Peter, James, and John, just the, just the three, they went up and, and Jesus, like in that moment, like they got to see who he was. They got to see his divinity. They got to see him in all of his glory. And, and Peter, of course, you know, he's, he always has to say something. And so Peter goes, Lord, it is good that we are here. Yes, very good. That's awesome. You know, it's kind of like just say the obvious. And I think that's what we've had here this weekend. It is good that we are here. But in the same way that, that Peter, like he got to that point, he said, Lord, it's good that we are here. We should build three tents. Like he wanted to set up some permanency there on the mountain where Jesus was transfigured. And it was like, wouldn't it be great? I, I, I mean, this isn't in Scripture, but I'm, my, my guess is that it's like, hey, let's, let's, get the, let's get the rest of the guys and bring them up here. Like this would be cool. And I'm sure there's, there's some feelings of maybe that kind of desire, that desire for you to want to, like, let's just stay here. I mean, you, I mean, obviously you have the op- opportunity in a couple of years if you want to go to school here, so that's pretty awesome. But still, it is not our mission here with these Steubenville conferences for you guys to come up here and have this incredible experience and then it be it. Our intent is to come here, hopefully, that you are fed by the love of Jesus Christ, and then to go back into the world. And then sometimes it's a very scary world. Our culture is, is crazy, right? And it seems like every year it gets crazier and crazier. But we're supposed to come down. We're supposed to live out that concluding right that you're going to hear today at the end of Mass. Go and proclaim the gospel with your life. Those aren't just cute words that they say at the end, so it's like, okay, the final send-off. It it is a commission, and we're going to hear about that great commissioning today in the gospel. To go and proclaim the good news. To go and proclaim what you have heard from the mountaintop. And take it to the valley. Take it back to your homes. Take it back to your families. Take it back to your schools. Back to your youth groups. Back to your friends. Wherever it is, it is now that time to go. To proclaim the gospel with your lives. When I was a kid, um, I... I went to this school uh, where they didn't have a playground, and it was just, it was kind of sad, but um, not really, you know, so we just made up games, right? We didn't have the, we didn't have a basketball goal, we didn't have, uh, we, we didn't have the playground equipment, it was just a big parking lot. And it was like, and the teacher's like, all right, just go, go play. And we're like, what do we do? And so, as you know, when you get a group of guys together, like, the brain power exponentially falls, right, with every, you know, critical thought just just plummets with every additional guy that joins the group, you know. And that is what, yeah, guys are like, yeah, right, guys? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so, so there we are. We're out there one day trying to figure out what we want to do, what we want to play, and we, we made up this game called We Never Stop. Imagine this, a bunch of, you know, third graders Joining arms, you know, joining, linking, you know, ourselves together, and and then a long line sideways, and we're walking through the playground, going, we never stop, we never stop, 
And it's just like this big wave of guys side by, you know, and it's just like, we never stop. And we didn't. Little girls sitting on the playground braiding their hair. La, 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 la. We never stop. <laughs> Rolled over them. We had like little first graders, you know, they're sitting there going, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. We never stop. <laughs> Rolled over to the first grader. And we didn't. We never stopped. And I'm sure that the teachers, like when I'm thinking about it right now, they must have thought, they're special. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, we need to do something for them, I think. I don't know. So anyway, but see, but see, that's the thing is that, that our experience here should compel us to not stop, right? Our experience here at, uh, on this hill um, hopefully has made it to where, you know what, I don't want to stop. And you know what? And the Lord is not done with you. The Lord is not done with you. In Philippians Philippians 1.6 says this, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I am confident in this, that the one who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. Last night it was said that, um, as Oscar was talking, and then Chris came up afterwards, like, that moment for him, it changed everything. But the Lord didn't stop working in his life. And maybe that was a similar experience that you had last night. Maybe it was like, okay, this is it. This is the moment. Here's my mountaintop. Lord, I want to go out those doors for you. I want for you to continue to work. But see, that's the thing. We have to be willing to say, you know what? Lord, I know that you're not done with me. You've just, you've just turned me and you have, you have impacted me in such a way that, that now I want to go back into the world differently. And I want to look into the culture differently. But we have to recognize that just because you had an incredible experience up here doesn't mean that the struggle's not going to be real. In fact, it might even be more challenging when you go home. But be confident in this, that the Lord is not done with you yet. Like I said, when we have an encounter with the Lord, it should compel us to go. I mean, think about this. If you're familiar with the woman at the well, right? The Lord encountered her at the well and told her everything about herself. Like, he, he knew her. He knew her. And because he knew her, it, it floored her. And he looked into her, and he knew everything that she was and who she wasn't. And then what did that compel her to do? It compelled her to go back into town and said, come see the guy who knows everything about me. Come meet the man who told me everything about myself. On the road to Emmaus, the two, the two disciples are walking there. Jesus comes alongside them. And then they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. And that happens at night, right? That happens at the end of the day. And they don't go, and, you know, Jesus vanishes in, from, from them in that moment. And they don't just go, well, that was crazy. Uh, all right, let's sleep, and then let's go back tomorrow morning. No, they got up at the moment, and it compelled them to move and to run back and go, we have seen the Lord. That is the kind of tenacity that we must have once we walk out those doors. You should want to be going, you guys, you got to hear what happened. you got to hear what happened to me this weekend, the way that the Lord touched me. And people are going to be looking at you like, what are you, you nuts? And you know what? I think you should just like mentally prepare yourself for some of that pushback. Some people are going to be so excited. Maybe your parents are going to be just, praise God that you had this experience. And I am so happy that that was such a great experience for you. But then there's going to be some that are going to have like the pushback against you, right? Because, because the culture does not line up with what we have experienced here this weekend. But you have it. You have it within you. You have the ability to do that. You have the ability and, quite frankly, you have the responsibility to go and proclaim that. 
with your lives. Don't let this just lay idle up here. Don't let this just be something that just happened. Go back because you are a necessary part of God's story. You're a necessary part of the story that God wants to tell to the world, and you are part of that story. Hopefully, because of what you've experienced here, you're going to go back into the world, and it might look a little bit different. The world has not changed. You have. It might look a little bit different. You might go back and go, wow, I, I never noticed, I never noticed this in my life. I never noticed this in, in my world, whatever your world is. Sometimes when we talk about the world, you know, you have the ability to change the world. It, it seems big, right? It's just maybe, maybe it's a little too daunting, and so we decide, ah, I can't do the world. Don't do the world. It's too big. Do your world. Do your world. Your friends, your family, your school, whatever activity groups you happen to be in, that is your world. Start there. I heard a story um, and met this girl a number of years ago, a high school student who lived in New Orleans, and she was very wealthy. In fact, I'm just going to give you kind of a perspective. She had an elevator in her house, okay? So if that just kind of puts a little perspective on her wealth. And so she's sitting at a stoplight with her dad one day. She's sitting in the passenger seat, and um, she... And, and I don't know what kind of compelled her to this. Perhaps she had an experience of a retreat at her school. But she sits there and she looks over and she sees a homeless man sitting on the corner. And then right up next to the homeless man, as they're sitting in their Mercedes, right, she looks over and sees that there's a BMW right next to this homeless man. And it just kind of dawned on her in this moment. She goes, you know, like, if... If that guy who's driving the BMW would, like, sell his BMW and then give some of his money to the homeless man, the homeless man wouldn't be homeless anymore. And her dad kind of laughed at that because, I mean, considering where they lived and considering the car that they were in. But she shared it that night, and, and she's like, I just I feel like I want to do something. And her mother's like, do you want to do something? And she's like, yeah. She goes, do you want to sell the house? And Hannah, this girl, she goes, yes. And guess what? Through a conversation with their family, they sold the house. They sold the house and moved into a house that was half the size. Now you're sitting there going, okay, so they're, they're probably still in a house bigger than any house I've ever lived in in my entire life, right? But, but the point was is that she recognized a problem in the world, and she was like, I, I can do something about that. And even as a high schooler, like she inspired her family to, to, to cut their, their living in half and to give what they had in excess to charity, to the poor. And you're like, well, what, what, what can I do? Well, I mean, I even heard one of her friends talk about that she used her babysitting money. And instead of using it all for her, she used half. And the other half she put towards something. And so the great thing about that is that Half is measurable, right? Because sometimes we go, oh, I, I want to do more. I want to do more for other people. What, what does that mean? It's kind of nebulous. And in this moment, it was like half. What is half? What can I do? How can I make my life, uh, how can I trim my life down to half? And what can I do with the excess that I don't have? Like, to me, that's incredibly inspiring that this high school student had this moment of revelation. And see, She's no different than any of you. She just happened to look out into the world and see a problem and then came up with a solution. And so when we look at our culture and we look at the people around us and we look at the world around us, when we start looking at it through the eyes of Jesus, we start, start looking at it through the eyes of the perspective that maybe we've gotten this weekend and we start to recognize, we start to see the world differently. We start to see the need of the world and we start to see, and, and we have to ask ourselves, how can I proclaim the gospel with my life in that moment? And it's tough. 
but our encounter with Jesus changes the way we look at the world. So I'm going to read from Acts now, and um, so Acts is like the first book where the apostles have been empowered to go out into the world, hence the name of the book, Acts of the Apostles, right? They've been filled with the Holy Spirit, they've had an encounter with Jesus, and now they've been empowered and emboldened to go out into the world, and so Paul goes to Greece, and he goes to Athens. So in Athens, if, if you know your history, then you know that they were, they, they, they worship many gods. And here Paul goes in to Athens and says there is one God. There is one God. And it says right at the beginning of Paul in Athens, it says while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was waiting for his, his, his brothers to come he grew exasperated at the sight of the city of idols. Like, he walks in there, and it's just like he became frustrated. He came, and in some ways, exasperated might be infuriated. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I look in our world, and I'm... I just get mad. I get mad at the temptations. I get mad at the absence of God. I get, I get mad at this just like, you do you and I'll do me and we're okay with that. And there's just like no compass, there's no fortification, there's no like center that, that the world is, 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 is focused on and holding on to. And I just get, I, I get exasperated. I get a little bit frustrated. I just got to be honest. When we have that encounter and we see into the world, we see it with different eyes. And so he's over there proclaiming Jesus, and he's over there proclaiming, preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. In fact, they even thought they were talking about two different gods, Jesus and the resurrection. He thought Jesus was one person and resurrection was like some goddess, right? But no. So, so they were so confused because that was their worldview, right? They had no other worldview except it for that. And he goes on to say, I proclaim to you the God who made the world and all that is in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in sanctuaries made by human hands, nor, does he, nor is he served by the human hands because he needs anything. Rather, it is he who gives to everyone life and breath and everything. It is he who gives to everyone life and breath and everything. For in him we live and move and have our being. Or we should in him live and move and have our being, right? There were these guys that um, I had the privilege of knowing and, and still do know, uh, but when they went off to college, they were at um, Louisiana State University. And um, it's a humongous campus. And these guys had really started to become brothers in Christ and really started to fortify one another. They were really in that moment of like, hey, we're, we're going out two by two. And they had linked up together. They had just, they're going to take care of one another. And so they're walking across campus one day, and Matt, this is Matt and Patrick, so Matt is looking up, and he notices this girl walking towards them, fellow student walking towards them from a, you know, a couple hundred feet away, but he knows that they're going to cross paths. And I'll just say this, that the way that they described it was like she was beautiful and she was physically beautiful and she wasn't doing a whole lot to, to, to cover that up, okay? And so there wasn't a lot left to the imagination. And so Matt, in this moment, he sees her and he recognizes Man, if, if I'm not careful, I'm going to lust. I'm going to fall into that sin of lust. And so what he did, he turned to his friend Patrick, and they had this thing that they did with each other. They had this way of holding each other accountable. And he turned to his friend Patrick, and he says, hey. And he shook his hand. He's like, I'm a Catholic Christian man. And it was like that was it. That was the sign. That was the cue that, that hey, I, 
Matt to Patrick, Matt, and Patrick's like, oh, okay, you're being tempted. I don't know what this is, but we're going we're gonna to deviate. We're going we're gonna to walk. I, and I forget what they did. I don't know if they, like, just walked off the path or they turned around or if they, they did something or they just, like, locked into each other and were like, we're just going to have this conversation. But I was just so inspired by that. Like, they didn't get mad at the culture. They, they pivoted in the culture. And they looked out for one another. It's important that we, that we look into the world and see, how can, how can I encounter the culture a little bit differently? How can I look in the world and see it just a little bit differently? How can I look into the ordinary and see the extraordinary? Remember the first time that I ever heard a secular song, just a non-Christian song, that was turned upside down for me and for me to hear it and with new ears. It was a song by 10,000 Maniacs called Trouble Me. You've probably never heard it, and now you're going to go home, and you're going to be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google that, or I'm going to check for it on Spotify. But I remember hearing that song, and they were like, what if this was Jesus saying to you, trouble me with all your hurts and all your worries and all your concerns? And it wasn't written that way, but then I started to see it in a different way, and I started listening to music in a different way. And it made me start watching movies in a different way. And watch, <laughs> and, and I, I hear laughing, and, and not watching some movies because, again, what am I seeing? Am I seeing the vanity of the world? And is that, is, does that line up with what I've experienced here? Does that line up with the way that Jesus wants to be for me, as Paul says, be in me to live and move and have his being. Sometimes those worlds don't match up. So I'd like to offer you, through a, a, another scripture verse, a way that you can maybe just take inventory of your life. Take inventory of where you are right now and and decide, is this something that, that, I can, that I can change? Is this something that maybe God is calling me? Is there areas in my life that God is calling me to move um, a little bit differently? And that the scripture verse is 1 Timothy 4.12. Say it with me. 1 Timothy 4.12. Or repeat, yeah. So I'm going to start it. You, you finish it. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Say it all together by yourself. One, two, three, go. You're like, all right, so what does 1 Timothy 4.12 say? 1 Timothy 4.12 says, and I talked about it yesterday in my talk, that let no one look down upon you because you're young, but be an example to the believers in your faith, your love, your speech, your conduct, and your purity. Your speech, your love, your conduct your faith, and your purity. Look into your life and see how does my life and my embracing maybe of the culture that I'm in contrast with the life that Jesus is calling me in my speech. Is my speech uplifting? Is my speech, does it, does it exhibit any sort of control? Am I cussing a lot or am I able to control that inclination? It says the strongest man in the world is the one with the most self-control. What is, what is, what are my, what are my, what's my speech like? What is my love like? Do I think of myself first? Or as my friend one time uh, pitched it to me, Am I third? God, others, and myself. How do I love in the world? How do I love in the world? My conduct. Are my actions a reflection that I believe in Jesus Christ and that I've brought Jesus' life into my life? Do my actions speak that into the world? have to look at every aspect 
of who we are. Am I only Catholic by name? Or do I believe, does my life speak or at least strive to speak of a relationship with Jesus? I got, um, I I was, uh, years ago, I I got into this game called Words with Friends, and it became an addiction, and I remember being at a restaurant one time, and uh, I was playing it, and I was like, I was playing it all of the time, and I was like all into it, and the server came by, and he's like, oh man, I love that game, it's like, it's like crack, I'm like, delete. It was hard, but it was like, like if you want to do words with friends, you should do what my, my a seventh grader in my ministry back home did. They started texting scripture verses back and forth to each other. Seventh grade. They would hear something, they would see something, and it was like words of affirmation. Those are the words with friends we need to be giving out. Amen? In my faith, Do I just give God the minimum, or am I giving him more of me? Is he just a passing thought, or am I giving him what is due to him in my faith and in my purity? Y'all, we need to take inventory of our life in this area. Whether it's how we express ourselves out into the world, to other people, or what we're consuming with our eyes, with our ears, and what we're doing with our bodies. How are we living a life of purity that says, I am in Jesus and I live and move and have my being within him? As again, we're going to hear in the gospel today about going out two by two. And so my, my, final, my final message, my final challenge, my final encouragement to you is I've, as I've thrown this stuff at you and I've said, hey, look at the culture and, and take inventory of your own life in order for you to be that voice of Jesus out into the world. As I've said that, one thing that I, I know that for certain is that we cannot do this alone. We must have someone to walk with. We must have some, some accountability we must have people that we are willing to say, hey, you know what, even if it's just one or person, let's back each other up. In fact, in fact, there's, at another time, I, uh, I, was, I met some seminarians who came up with this idea, these guys who were actually moving towards the seminary, but they said, you know what, we have this group that we get together, it's called Backed Up. We get together on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, Backed, B-A-C-D. I know, for those of you that are like, wait, that didn't, that didn't spell Backed the way I know it. Bible, they got together and they read scripture. A, adoration, they got together and they went to adoration, whether it was in a perpetual adoration chapel or whether it was just sitting in front of the blessed sacrament um, in a tabernacle. They went and they had adoration. Bible, adoration, confession. You heard Chris talking about today. They went to confession regularly and they held each other accountable in that area. And D, they went out to dinner. They just hung out. Back each other up. Be backed up. As we, as, as we move into a, a time of worship, let us trust in the fact and the reality and the truth that the one who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, there's this big misnomer, this big misunderstanding that, that, that Jesus only loves us where we're at and that's it. Yes, Jesus loves you where you're at. He loves you in your brokenness. He loves you in your pain. He loves you in your suffering. He will be there for you and be in all those areas of your life and he will meet you where you are. But I'll tell you one thing, and this is it. He loves you way too much to leave you where you're at. 
He loves you way too much to leave you where you're at. And so, yeah, it's going to be hard. You're going to go back home, and you're like, Jesus, I don't want to go, but I love you, and I don't want to leave you where you're at. I want you to come with me. I want you to come to this place where I can bring you to a higher place in your life, to a higher way of looking at the world, a higher existence, and a better way of living. Because Jesus doesn't want to just live in this life. He wants us to be with him in eternity with him forever. Amen? Amen.